أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم Dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to another session of uh, Mizan Live on Shia Imamiyah Doctrine uh, before I begin today, I just want to make a little small announcement, and that is that uh, this will be our um, this is our last session, of course, for July. Today is July thirtieth, but other than that, um, also this is going to be our last session for a while. So coming this August, we're not going to be having any sessions. Sheikh Mahdi was traveling, of course, in the summer, and he wasn't available for sessions, so I was doing them. And once, uh, now he's back, but uh, the August is going to be Dhul Hijjah, a very, very uh, busy month for, all, for everybody in our centers and all the programs that we're having. So we won't have time really to have uh, Mizan live this next August, this, this uh, coming August. Uh, but then after that, inshallah, once uh, the 10 days of Muharram are over, hopefully, hopefully we will pick up where we left off with Shia Imamiyah doctrine and other um, uh, sessions as well that we're going to have with our respected instructors. Hopefully, we can get even um, other instructors as well to start doing their thing. Hopefully, inshallah. Okay, having said that, let's go into today's topic. Today, we're going to um, we're going to continue where we left off. Uh, but before that, I'm going to just go over what we covered last week, just to get us just to get us um, on the same page here. Just pulling up my the notes. Yes. Okay. So last week we um, started with article number 81 of the book, which had to do with the alteration of the Qur'an. As I said last week, this is a very, very important subject and a very deep subject and one that has many books written on it, m much discourse and much debate and discussion regarding it, whether it's Orientalist, whether it's Shia, whether it's Sunni, whatever it is, Islam. Um, this is a topic that is, of course, of the utmost importance as well. Very, very important because, as I said last week, this is the pillar of Islam. The Qur'an is the pillar of Islam. Without the Qur'an, you don't have, you can, maybe you can, one can say that you don't have Islam. And Islam can go down the drain, maybe. So, beca because that is the only way uh, that uh, the truthfulness of this of this religion can be understood, if the Quran is there. If there's no Quran, we have a very, very, very big problem. As the Holy Prophet said, that it is the weightier of the two things, of the two uh, weighty things, which that he's leaving behind. One, be one being the Quran, and one being the Ahl Bayt. Um, so. Having said that, Article 81 was about this. It started this whole uh, discussion. This whole uh, discussion on, excuse me, the whole discussion on the alteration of the Quran. Now, last week, what we covered, well, basic stuff. As I said, he doesn't want to. He wants to keep it concise. He started out by talking about how the uh, different faiths. And different religions have had their books, but we believe that they have been altered. They've been altered, and you know, some books just you know changed. Some books turned totally upside down, like the uh, Injil that the whole the Prophet Isa came with. We believe as Muslims that it was really turned upside down because what we have today of the new the New Testament today does not represent that which was revealed unto Prophet Isa according to Islam and the Muslims. Um, the new, the Gospels that we have, the four canonical Gospels, those everyone knows, they themselves say it, that yes, these were accounts written by people who were there observing Jesus, or the Lord as they call Him, um, in His human form, and I don't, I don't want to get into the details of that, I'm not the one to do that, that's 
their job to explain to us. I don't want to misrepresent them, the Christian faith. So that we believe that that has been turned totally upside down. With the Torah, a little bit less, but still it has, we, we believe that there's alteration there. Anyway, Ayatollah Subhani started out with this, and then he made his way into the reasons why we believe that our book has not been altered. And so he brought a couple verses of the Qur'an, the famous verse that says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرُ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لحافظون, That we sent down the Qur'an and we're the ones to protect it. Yes? Or another verse that said, لَا يَأْتِهِ الْبَاطِلُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَلَا مِنْ خَلْفِهِ تَنْزِيلٌ مِنْ حَكِيمٍ حَمِيدٌ That this is a book that batil and falsehood does not make its way into. And so if you're going to, if, if, people can add to it, that means falsehood has made its way into it. So that goes against, that goes against the, uh, the, the promise that the Qur'an has made to us that Allah is going to protect it. Okay, so those were verses that he covered, we discussed those last week. Then we talked about how the people of the Prophet's time, they had very good memories and they were just into memorization of everything, poetry, whatever it was. Now, we also had this same thing applying to the Qur'an that people of that time memorized the Qur'an. Lots of people were memorizing the Qur'an. And so this Qur'an was preserved in the hearts of the people as well. There's this Farsi saying, Qur'an ra hifz kunim ta hifz shabat. We will do hifz of the Qur'an so that it becomes hifz. So one of the meanings of hifz means to memorize in Farsi. The other meaning of hifz means to protect. So memorize to protect. Back in the day, that's one of the ways the Qur'an was protected is that it was memorized. So he also goes through that. That's also a reason for him that the Qur'an cannot be altered or it makes it much harder for it to be altered. Another one is that uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam, we all know, Shia, Sunnah, we all know that he was a person that was not compromising on his principles. And so if you see him quiet and never bringing up the fact that, hey, people, don't touch the Qur'an, don't try to alter it, that shows that he knows that the Qur'an is the same one sent unto the Prophet. The one that the people have in their hands is the same one that was revealed unto the Prophet. Okay, so that's another reason he brings. And then he brought a hadith by Imam Ali السلام, that showed as well that the Imam believes in the Qur'an that was with the people and that he's telling the people to refer to it. Then he brings a whole list of greats of the Shia school of thought from all the way, maybe the third century, yeah, third century after the Hijrah, all the way till contem- well, almost contemporary times. Now, well, not, I'm not going to say contemporary, till Allama Hilli. He brings a lot of names of ulama that believe that the Quran was not altered. This is very important, once again, because as we will discuss today even more, that just because there's a person out there from the Shia school of thought that believes in the alteration of the Quran doesn't mean that the Shia mainstream believes that. So bringing a list of these greats like Allah Hilli and Shaykh Al-Tusi, Sayyid Murtada, Shaykh Al-Mufid, Shaykh Al-Saduq, all these people, bring that list of names of really superstars of Shia school of thought as supporters of the fact that there is no alteration in the Qur'an helps also push that argument forward that the Shia, the Shia faith does not believe in the alteration of the Qur'an. Then we got into Article 82, which was, this is very important now. Um, today you're going to have to uh, buckle your seatbelts because we got a lot to cover. Article 82, last week we covered also, had to do with the hadiths that we have. And this is where the problem starts, brothers and sisters. The hadiths that we have regarding the alteration of the Qur'an. And they might be high in number as well. But the ulama have done their due diligence and done the work to prove that these hadiths are very problematic, not just problematic, very problematic, whether it's because they are weak hadith, whether it's because they go back to people that we know are liars, or have an agenda, or as Imam Khomeini had said, that they are either weak hadith, fabricated hadith, or they are correct hadith, and they're authentic, reliable hadith, but the meaning and the content of those hadiths has been misunderstood and has been taken to imply alteration of the Qur'an, while in reality it is implying something else. He says, these, this is the story behind all these hadiths that we have. Now, it's not just in Shi'i sources. We have to understand, brothers and sisters, you will have the same concept in Sunni sources as well. It is not fair for a Shi'i 
to call out the Sunni school and say, hey, you have hadiths on alteration of Qur'an. At the same time, you can't have uh, Sunnis um, calling out Shia and saying that you have uh, uh, hadiths that are problematic because they speak about uh, alteration of Qur'an. All right, so that's that's something important that we need to discuss. We need to you know talk about later, maybe in more detailed sessions, what these hadiths are, which books have mentioned these hadiths, etc. For now, we're just in general. I'm saying that yeah, this stuff is out there, and that uh, it can't be denied, but it can be discussed. It can be un- re- interpreted, revisited, reinterpreted, and so on and so forth. Okay, having said all of that, now let us move into today's discussion. Today's discussion is a little point that we left off of um, when we were uh, discussing uh, last week's session in Article 81. So we're not done with Article 80, excuse me, 82. We were not done with Article 82. Okay? We were not done with it. And the last part of it I left for today because there's a lot of stuff I want to add to it. As I've said again and again, this book the, it tries to keep things concise and to the point. But I just have to go through this because I just have to add a few things today because I feel that maybe in the future these uh, recordings will be watched or listened to and um, people might not get the chance to look into things deeper and uh, they might just have certain impressions of things that are not, might, that might, not might, might not be very accurate if you know what I mean. So. I'm just going to, and since this is a very important subject, that's why I'm going to be adding a little bit and just elaborating a little bit more here. So the last part of Article 32, he talked about how, hey, people, if, if you want to know what the beliefs of a school of thought are, what the beliefs of, um, what's it called, of a, of a faith are, going to the books of hadith of that faith, of that denomination, Shi'ism, Sunniism, just going to the books of hadith is not going to be enough to now hold that faith to those hadiths and say that this is what you believe in and there's no way out of it. No, that's not the case. He says that for that you have to go to their ulama, you have to go to their scholars, you have to go to their books of of, of, of beliefs, not the books of hadith. The books of hadith will be used. Every person will have their beliefs, of course. Every Sunni Shia will have their beliefs, of course. But when it comes to understanding the details of a faith, we're going to go to the, to the sources and we're going to d- extract from the sources the beliefs and put them in our own books of beliefs and theology, etc. So that's a point that he makes is very important. I have a story for this actually. Uh, a few years ago when I was in Hajj, yeah, I was at the Baqi, uh, the graveyard of Baqi. And so there you're, you're standing and you're doing your dua and you're sending your salam on the uh, Prophet's progeny and family. And so the, the, the Wahhabi Shaykh took me down to the bottom floor of that place of the Baqi, they have offices under um, the stairs that go up to the Baqi graveyard. Anyway, he took me there, he sat me down, he brought out his book that was that said, Mada Taqulu Shia, that this is what the Shia believe in. And so he opened that book, he's like, see, these are the things you believe in, because we were having a little debate or discussion, I wouldn't call it a debate, I would just call it a discussion, I'm the one who actually kind of started that discussion, I started asking questions and um, he was answering and he told me, he was Afghan actually, so he wasn't like Arab and from that land. He had also migrated from his home uh, from Afghanistan and he had been in the in Medina for 21 years he told me. And so he showed me the book of uh, Mada Taqulu Shia, what the Shia believe in. Every page of it, most of it, was, I didn't get a chance to go through all of it, but Lots of the things that he was saying we believe in, the reason why he was making such a claim was because we have a hadith for it in one of our books. And I kept telling him, I'm like, look, our hadith books don't represent what we believe in necessarily. These have to be refined, right? 
when it comes to the Imams and belief in Imamah. We have hadith by Imam al rida it's famous, that Imam al rida says, people out there are making up hadiths about us Ahl al-Bayt, good things they're saying, to hurt our image. How does that work? Good things to hurt our, our image? Yes, good things. How? By making up, by exaggerating our status, making us as if we are deity, and introducing us as if we are deity. That's how they're doing it. So sometimes people want to give the Shia a bad name. They fabricate hadith <coughs> in favor of Ahlul Bayt, but to the extent that it's seen as mubalagha or ghulu, exaggeration. So we have to understand that these hadiths have to be refined, and that's what the scholars have done. This has been an ongoing thing forever. From the beginning of you can say uh, when theology, when Shia theology was expanding and growing during the time of the Imams even. And so they had these debates amongst themselves, the companions of the Ahlul Bayt and the Imams. So the point I'm trying to make is this, that I told that guy, I told him, that scholar, I told him, look, you can't just pull out our hadith books and say, see, this is what you believe in. Yeah, it's in our books, but we also believe that we have to, ch we have to refine certain hadiths, as is the case with you guys as well. Um, every school of thought, every faith is like that. You have, to, you have your own way of extracting your beliefs from your sources. That's why even in Bukhari sometimes you will find a hadith or two that are in favor of certain things that we might believe in, whether it's our history, Shia history, or if it's Shia beliefs even. But then those will be dismissed in the Sunni school, and they have every right to do that. Those are their books, and they have every right to approach them the way they, <coughs> they, seem, they see fit. And there's, they have their own methodology of refining these hadiths that are in those books. So we have to understand all of this. Not everything in, in a hadith book represents what that faith is all about. This is raw material to work with and to refine. Okay, having said that, he says, he goes into a few points. He, makes, he wants to make a few points before he ends Article 82 which is the last article of this um, chapter. We're going to be talking a lot here about different things. Now, number one, he says, first of all, after now that we've done, we're done with this, con con uh, this chapter of, uh, or these articles of alteration of the Qur'an, uh, we have to understand a few things. Number one, that accusing other schools of thought, of believing in alteration of Qur'an, in these times that we live in especially, all it does is serves the goals and the interests of the enemies of Islam. He makes that clear. And it's very obvious what, what, why the, the case is, when you, what, why that is the case. When you have Muslims who believe in the alteration of the Qur'an, the first thing that happens is takfir. Okay? The second thing, thing that happens is that there's no common ground for any more discussion and debate. Right? Think about it. If they tell you that there's a, there's a group of Muslims out there who believe you cannot rely on the Qur'an for everything that's in it. Why? Because the alteration has taken place in it. Are you going to want to sit down and speak to them about you know, Islam anymore? You're going to say, hey, there's nothing, there's nothing that we agree on. There's almost no common ground. You don't believe in the Qur'an the way I do. So there's no common ground here. We don't need to discuss anything apparently. That's number one. Or that's number two. Number one that I said before this is what, what happens is takfir happens. That if people don't believe in the Qur'an properly, the first thing that happens is they point fingers to each other and say, that person is kafir. That person has left the fold of Islam. And unfortunately today, since the world is full of so many ignorant people, unfortunately, they are driven not by their intellect and the, their, their understanding, but rather by their emotions. And they're quick to jump the gun and make the judgments about people and say, okay, this person has left the fold of Islam, that person has left the fold of Islam. You see this everywhere. And who are we kidding? It's in Shias, it's in Sunnis, it's everywhere, unfortunately. And it all goes back to ignorance and uh, not being well read into the faith and not being too literate, unfortunately. You usually won't find a great scholar you know, pointing the finger to other schools of Islam and calling them kafir just because of certain things that are attributed to them. They'll look into it, 
they know the heritage of other schools of thought is rich as well. And so they will appreciate that and they will acknowledge it. Unfortunately, the people that are not learned out there, they don't know any of this. And so all they do is, is just point the fingers as soon as they can. All right. So that's the first point that he makes. Okay. Second point that he makes, which we're going to spend a lot of time on, is um, regarding is regarding the uh, this whole understanding of once again alteration of Quran in another sense. Okay, so uh, I know that our video is just went out for a minute, but we're gonna we're, that's gonna get fixed, inshallah. Yeah. All right, so. <coughs> He says, let me read, maybe read off of the book from, and, then, and then get into it, inshallah. Article 82. Says, he says, If some Shi'i scholars have written books in which the alteration of the Qur'an is mentioned, we observe that after the publication of such books, Shia scholars have written many refutations of the errors contained in them. Okay, here a big point is made, very important point, and the reason why I'm going to get into this, although it's not in the book, is because of its importance. <clears throat> it is super important, because in the future, as I said, I don't know who's going to be listening to this, and I don't, want to, I don't want people to feel that we didn't get into some of the details while, while it was necessary. Brothers and sisters, he says here that some Shi'i scholars sometimes have throughout history maybe said that they believe in the alteration of the Qur'an. He says that. And that is a reality. And we need to discuss it. And see what the approach has been. The most famous of them, the, the, what the approach has been of other Shi'i scholars regard, towards that particular Shi'i scholar who has spoken about alteration of Qur'an. Before I get into that, let me just continue what the book is saying because this is not a Shi'i thing again, brothers and sisters. He says, in like manner, <coughs> excuse me, in like manner, when an Egyptian scholar published the book Al-Furqan in 1926, in which he tried to prove that the Qur'an has been altered, basing it upon certain narrations and hadiths found in the books of the Sunni school, concerning the abrogation or writing of certain Qur'anic verses, the sheikhs of Al-Azhar University of, Kai of Egypt repudiated the opinion and banned the book. Okay, so he says this, he makes this point, uh, Ayatollah Subhani. Look, first of all, the Sunni school also has dealt with this in the past. The Shi'i school also has dealt with it in the past. I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do today, inshallah. I'm going to illustrate this to you and show you how serious our scholars have taken this matter and they're not how uncompromising they are in this regard. Okay, what does he say? Or what can we say here? There's a person, brothers and sisters, those of you who understand Arabic especially, when you look, when you go on YouTube and you just search like alteration of Quran Shi'i, what you find is that a scholar is referred to a lot as a person who believed in alteration of Qur'an from Shi'i scholars. And as a result, what is concluded is, oh look, the Shi'a believe in this. Because one scholar said it, the Shi'a school believes in it. Well, first of all, who says whatever any scholar says represents all of Shi'ism and mainstream Shi'ism, one. And two, why don't you be fair and also share what other Shi'i scholars have said in response and in refutation of this one individual. Now, I'm not going to claim that there's only one person out there in the Shi'i scholars, amongst Shi'i scholars who might have implied that he believes in alteration of the Qur'an, but I want to talk about a person today by the name of Mirza Hussein and Nuri at Tabrasi. Yes, and uh, in short, they just call him Haji Nuri. Uh, and he's very famous, he's, a, he's referred to as a muhaddith, and there's no reason why I say he is referred to as a muhaddith, or a person who is in the sciences and is, has gone deep into the sciences of hadith and transmission of hadith. 
Haji Nuri is famous for this opinion of alteration of believing in the alteration of the Quran. He has a book called Faslul Khitab, which means like the uh, the final word or the last word on fi tahrif al Quran, alteration of the Quran. Okay, so that's his book. In that book, we're going to cover what he says now. The people who are against the Shi'i school, unfortunately, they, they don't play it fair. <laughs> the ones who actually call us out using this individual. And they say, look, he believes that the Quran, the, the Shi'a believe that the Quran has been changed because this is one of their scholars who says the Quran has been changed. Changed meaning like, you know, some parts added, some parts, you know, moved around, etc., etc. I'm going to pull up uh, the book of uh, al of one of his students, Agha Buzurik al-Tahrani, his name is. And those of you who are in Hawza, um, first of all, if you are in Hawza, I don't know why you're listening to these. But uh, <laughs> if you are, you know about this Adhariya. Adhariya is an encyclopedia, one of the best works ever on the works of Shi'i scholars throughout history, up until the time of this Agha Buzurk Tehrani, which I don't know when did he pass away. One second, let me look at this up real quick. <clears throat> Oh, he's on Wikipedia. So it says he passed away uh, February 1970. Born 1876, died 1970. Okay. So this Agha Buzurg Tehrani, he has this encyclopedia of all the works of Shi'i scholars till 19, let's say, let's say 50, 1970, whenever that he wrote this book, okay? It's, uh, I don't know how many volumes, 22 volumes I think it is, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it's really a rich work that great alims always have, and right next to them, you know, then they use it a lot. Okay, in his book, <clears throat> one of the works that he discusses is Faslul Khitab of Haji Nuri, which was his teacher, as I said, one of his teachers. In there he says, he says, he brings the, the book's name, and then he says, in this book, he says that what this Haji Nuri has done in this book, أَثْبَتَ فِيهِ عَدَمَ التَّحْرِيفِ بِالزِّيَادَةِ وَالتَّغْيِيرِ وَالتَّبْدِيلِ He says there are three things he says in this book that did not happen in the Qur'an. One, nothing has, this Qur'an that we have that's, you know, binded and is between covers, okay? This book, he says, nothing has been added to it. In other words, everything in it is Qur'an, revealed unto the Prophet. Not only has nothing been added to it, nothing has been changed in it, okay, altered in it, nothing has been moved around in it. He says, all of these things he has proven, that it's not the case, these did not happen in the Qur'an. So what is it that he believes in? He says that, he, that his teacher believed in, وَاخْتَارَ فِي خُصُوصِ مَا عَدَى آيَاتِ الْأَحْكَامِ he believes that yes, there are some verses that didn't make it into the Quran we have today. Once again, this is just one scholar who says this, not mainstream at all. And I'll get to what other scholars have said in refutation of uh, to him. So it says that yes, um, other than the ayat and the verses that have to have to do with Islamic law, there are some verses that have been taken out. Now, of course, probably it's the verse according to them because the hadiths that we have are like this as well, that it is the verses that have to do with the imamate of Ali ibn Abi Talib a.s. Things like that, Ahlul Bayt, stuff like that. Alright. He says, where did he get this from? He got this from a hadith. And then Shaykh Agha Buzurg Tehrani, as he's talking about this book, he says someone else by the name of Shaykh Mahmud Tehrani has refuted this. In his back in the day, refuted this book of Faslul Khitab and said in it that um, yeah has yes has, has refuted him completely and said he's wrong why does he believe in alteration of the Quran so right there it's been refuted already we'll get to scholars of today as well what they've said okay so back then even it was refuted this is where we have to be fair brothers and sisters whether you're Shi'i or Sunni to figure out everything that has happened and then make a judgment. If you're going to make a judgment about the Shia, 
If he wrote a book on Fasl al Khitab fi Tahrif al Quran, there's someone else in his time who wrote, who wrote back and against it and right there refuted it. And then, and then this Haji Nuri wrote a third work. So we had Fasl al Khitab, which implies that some verses were taken out. Nothing was added, but some things were taken out. Someone answers this, that's work number two. This Haji Nuri now comes back and answers the answer that was given to him. He says, look man, look. I know the name of my book is Fasl al-Khitab fi Tahrif al-Quran. The last word, the final say on the Tahrif of Quran, on the alteration of Quran. I understand that. But, have you read the book? He says, I am not happy with a person who reads that book of mine but doesn't read this little treatise that I've also given out after in, in reply to those who think that I believe in alteration of the Qur'an. He says just because the title says the last say regarding alteration doesn't mean that I believe in all forms of alteration of the Qur'an, no. He says all I believe is that some verses might have been taken out. Now I'm going to open a parenthesis here that look, still that is a form of alteration <laughs> it seems. <laughs> Yes, no one added anything. Like you won't find, you believe that verses were, are not in there that people made up. Good for you. But if you believe that some verses were taken out, then that is a form of maybe alteration. Now, once again, the technicalities of this, we have, they're, they're, we have to. This is, has to do with Quranic sciences. It has, doesn't have to do with, with what we're trying to discuss now. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that might be seen as a form of alteration. So you're saying people. Don't, don't, don't just take the title and think that I believe in alteration. I just believe that some verses might have been taken out. Well, that is alteration. Anyway, parentheses closed. He says, if you're going to read that book, you have to read this little treatise of mine as well, where I've explained more what I mean. And as a matter of fact, I believe that the Qur'an we have today is exactly what was compiled during Uthman's time. So he believes that the Qur'an was compiled in Uthman's time. That's also something that's contested, by the way. But anyway, that is mainstream Islam right now. I'm not going to say mainstream Shia, but mainstream Islam says that, yeah, Uthman was the one, the third Khalifa was the one who compiled and put together, brought together the Qur'an, you know, and, you know, bound in, in between two covers. Right? So he says, that has not been touched. I believe that. He says that. But yeah, what was revealed to the Prophet, I believe some verses might have dropped, you know, and were taken out for obvious re reasons. Okay? Now, this Agha Buzurk Tehrani, who's explaining what his teacher says in his books, he says, I heard from my teacher myself that he said this too. He said that it might have been better if I had called this book Faslul Khitab, the last say regarding the lack of alteration of Quran, not alteration of Quran. And I think that is what is throwing people off and misleading them. Yeah. So just to sum it up and just to uh, summarize it very quickly once again. Agha Buzurk Tehrani, the one with the grand work of ad which has compiled, has put together, it's like an encyclopedia of all the different books of Shia. In that encyclopedia, he talks about a book by his, one of his teachers by the name of Haji Nuri, by the name of Fasl al-Khitab, Fi Tahrif al-Quran, or Fi Tahrif al-Kitab, where he says, where the title means, the last say regarding alteration of the Qur'an. He says in that book, he proves that the Qur'an is not altered as a matter of fact, not changed, moved around verses and things like that. Nothing has been added, but yes, yeah, some things have been subtracted. Yeah. And right there in that day, someone wrote an answer to that and refuted him. And then my teacher wrote, a th wrote something else to answer that answer. And my teacher said that that is not what I meant. I should have titled it something else. I should have titled it La Vase regarding lack of alteration of Quran. That's in a nutshell what we covered so far. Okay, but at the end of the day, the people who use Haji Nuri's book, Fasdul Khitab, to prove that the Shia believe in alteration of Quran, what's happening here is that they are turning a blind eye to all of these other things that are happening on the side which really, really, really put things more into perspective regarding what the Shia believe regarding this book, first of all. Second of all, he doesn't believe that, you know, things have been added and things have been like changed and moved around and stuff. He says, look, there are some verses that didn't make it to what we have today, but what we have today is all pure revelation. Yes, nothing has been added, uh, nothing has been added to this. These are the words of God, all of them, 100%. 
I opened the parentheses, I said, listen, at the end of the day, that's still called alteration in our dictionaries, right? But once again, there are technicalities here maybe that have to be covered in Quranic sciences. Now is not the time for that. Maybe that's not considered alteration in its technical sense. We don't know. We have to see if that's something to discuss later. Okay, so that is what Haji Nuri says. So it's not some crazy opinion that, you know, it's a, it's a mess. This Quran that we have is a mess. No, this Quran we have is the Quran. There's some things that are missing. It, but everything in it is Quran, is the Word of God. Okay, hopefully it's clear. I think it is. Now let's talk about, and my favorite part, let's talk about what scholars of contemporary scholars, but they've passed away, but they, you can call them contemporaries of this era, have said regarding uh, what Haji Nuri says in his book. There's a book called Kifayatul Usul. Kifayatul Usul is one of the books that's, that's studied in the ninth and 10th year of Hawza, unless things have changed. Um, but yeah, that's how it was when we were there. And um, it is one of the hardest books to study, to be honest with you. And it's a book of Usul al-Fiqh. I don't want to get into that. But in one of those sections of that book, we have uh, a part where it discusses Qur'an and how we are supposed to approach the Qur'an when we want to derive Islamic law from it. Now this book is such an important book in the Hawza. Lots of scholars have commentaries on it, have their notes on it and footnotes and so on. Imam Khomeini is one of them, Ayatollah Adma al khoi is another one and many more but I want to talk about these two. Imam Khomeini of course he's known for his political you know, involvement and everything. So the first thing that comes to mind sometimes when Imam Khomeini's name is mentioned is politics. But we cannot forget Imam Khomeini was huge. Imam Khomeini was a giant when it came to Hawza credentials. Everyone knew it. I think personally that's one of the reasons why he was able to do what he did was because everyone knew this guy is way up there. He's way up there when it comes to ijtihad. Uh, friend and foe, of course, you know they they uh, they acknowledge that. I've seen actually very big foes of him. <laughs> they do acknowledge that he was a huge scholar. All right. Anyway, what he says is interesting here regarding what Haji Nuri says in his book Fasul Khitab. So let's go back a little. Haji Nuri had a book Fasul Khitab. In his time, people answered him. Till today, people are answering him. Poor guy. <laughs> of grand scholars, people like Khu'i, people like uh, Imam Khomeini, Ayatollah Uthma Khu'i, these are people who are still refuting him till today and even after them. Okay, I'm just going to read to you what Imam Khomeini says in his book, which is a book of a, like a commentary on um, Kifayatul Usul of Akhund al-Khurasani. Because Akhund al-Khurasani also in his book Kifayatul Usul kind of, you know, says, hey, there is some room to believe that there might have been some verses taken out. Okay, here people go crazy. <laughs> people, like, I mean, when I say people like grand scholars, they go crazy when, when it comes to this part. I'm just going to read to you what Imam Khomeini says in his book, in this regard, and Warul Hidayah, his book. Okay, he says, let me explain further. He's talking about this whole idea of alteration, Qur'an, can we rely on the Qur'an? In a nutshell, he's like, let's not even talk about that. I mean, don't even go there. That's what he's saying. He says... If, if this issue was the way the author of Sahibu Fasl al Khitab, the author of Fasl al Khitab had said, meaning Haji Nuri, if it's really the way he thought that you know, some verses might have been taken out, so he's going to tell us right now, if it was the case, then this. But before I get into that, these scholars, they don't call out people out by name ever, almost ever. Even when they want to speak good about somebody in their books, they might not say their name. That's just how it is. That is one of the ways that they have in the Hawza, in these books. They'll say like some of my contemporaries or one of the great scholars has said this and then they'll critique it. Alama um, Tabatabai in Tafsir of Al-Mizan does the same thing. He won't say the name of the person usually. And uh, this sometimes does cause problems as well because you want to know exactly where this has been written so you can't find it because you don't know who they're actually quoting. So now in this excerpt that I'm going to share with you, you can tell something's wrong because he's calling him out by name and others have done the same as well. So this is, this, is what, this is what I mean when I say it's not fair. 
to label the Shia as people who believe in alteration of the Qur'an, because one scholar said it, although a hundred other scholars have refuted it. So he says, Imam Khomeini says, if it was really the case, as if what uh, the author of Fasl al-Khitab has said was really the case, the way he thought that there has been alteration, and then he starts talking about this individual first. Okay, it's no, it's not hidden to people who are a little familiar with Hawza studies and Hadith studies in particular, that Haji Nuri's famous work of Mustadrakul Wasail, that this work, although it's like big and a huge, and like a bunch of volumes, like maybe 30 volumes or something, it is not hidden to those who are in these sciences that this work is not, doesn't have any value. What he's done is he brings hadiths that have not been mentioned in Wasailu Shia. And of course he has his own criteria. The, ver- the, the hadiths that have not been mentioned in Wasailu Shia, he brings them and he br- puts them in this collection of Mustadrak Wasailu Shia, that which you know, is going to complete or supplement Wasail al-Shia. Of course, Wasail al-Shia is one of the greatest books that we have that our maraja are always using for their fatwas. Okay, we have to understand that as well. Whatever that book has missed, he says, I brought in my book. Well, maybe there's a reason why they didn't bring those hadiths in their books like Wasail al-Shia, because they're not reliable. So now here, Imam Khomeini, because this is such a touchy subject, an important and significant subject, as I said in the beginning of our talk, it is a pillar of Islam, the Qur'an, Imam Khomeini goes all out, guns blazing. And it's not just him, others too, like Ayatollah Khui and others as well have, have done the same. First, instead of refuting the opinion, he destroys the works of this individual first. He says, look, Haji Nuri, may Allah bless his soul, wonderful guy, teacher of uh, this Agha Buzurk Tehrani, teacher of, one of the teachers of the person who wrote Mafatih al-Janan, Sheikh Abbas Qummi and others, Wonderful person, but His books don't help you in theory or in action. There's nothing in them. It is just books of that have, it's a book that has brought, his books, his books are books that he's just brought into those books. Hadith that are weak that others have turned away from because they're weak. So why are you going to bring those in? And those who have minds and intellects have stayed away from and refrained from. Of the greats of the past who have compiled, you know, Shaykh Tusi, Shaykh Saduq, and these types of individuals who have the four main hadith books, have compiled the four main hadith books, and of course Shaykh Al Kulaini. These people, they've turned away from certain hadiths because they're not reliable, but he's brought them into his book. Okay. He says, this is his books of hadith. They have this major issue. That's why no one takes Mustadrak al-Wasail very seriously, brothers and sisters. Yes, it will be used sometimes to supplement certain things, but that's about it. If a hadith can only be found in Mustadrak al-Wasail, you are not going to find a fatwa based on that. One hadith that's in Mustadrak al-Wasail, which belongs to Haji Nuri. Alright. He says, this is how his books of hadith are, like the book of Mustadrak, he says. And then he says, this is an interesting wording, he says, Don't even ask and talk to me about the rest of his books that are books that are not books of hadith. He says, those, book are full, those books are full of stories and some narrations, not hadith narrations, like, you know, narration stories that are so weird. Most of them seem to be jokes than rather serious stuff. <laughs> And he, this individual, Haji Nuri, rahimahullah, may Allah bless his soul, but, I mean, he was shakhsun salih, righteous individual, mutatabbi, he was, he was a researcher, he would go read a lot. But, you know, this motivation and enthusiasm that he had to put, put together weak hadiths and stories and strange narrations and things that make no sense that al-aql salim a sound mind cannot accept, this is more in his works than من الكلام النافع from the, more than beneficial words that can be one can benefit from you won't find that as much as you will find strange things that he's brought okay he says wal ajab i'm surprised that his contemporaries people who you know they were woke 
you know, in, in today's terms, okay? And they knew what's going on. They didn't say anything about him. They neglected him. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the people of that, that time thought that, you know, this stuff that he's saying doesn't make any sense. We don't have to worry about it too much. Maybe that's what it was. But he says they neglected and they were oblivious to it until that which happened, happened. What happened? Look at the wording. Mimma bakat alayhi samawat. The stuff that was said by this individual is stuff that the, that the skies wept over. The skies wept over the things that he said. Okay, well, messing with the Qur'an's reliability and authenticity is not something to joke about. وَكَادَتْ تَتَدَكْتَكُوا الْأَرْضِ And some, I guess this means that there's, you know, it's that close that the earth was going to explode as a result of what he had said. Wow! <laughs> That's pretty significant. And then Imam Khomeini goes into refutation of what he's saying. This is interesting because this is something that some of our youth today even are you know, talking about and stuff and they say now and then about how yeah, the Qur'an was full of verses about the imamah of Imam Ali السلام, and the Ahlul Bayt etc. etc. He says, if it is the case that there were so many verses in the Qur'an that were taken out that speak about uh, the wilaya of the Ahl al-Bayt and the Imam of, uh, of Imam Ali alayhi salam, if that was really the case, then why is it, he says, that none of these verses of the Qur'an were used by Imam Ali after the Prophet's death to prove his Imamah? Not one, not one account do we find, brothers and sisters, where Imam Ali himself says, hey, you know those verses that were in the Qur'an that you took out about me? He says, why didn't Hazrat Bibi Fatima alayhi salam use those verses? Fatima Zahra was not a person to compromise. You'll find her arguments and how she's debating with the Khulafa after the Prophet's demise. But never does she say anything about, oh there was a verse. Or there, what about these 10, 20 verses? You know they were there, you took them out. We don't have anything like that, he says. Al-Hasan, al Hussein, none of these individuals alayhim as salam used, argued with verses that now we don't have in the Qur'an. Because brothers and sisters, we have to understand if this type of alteration was to take place and certain verses were to be taken out of the Qur'an, that was going to happen later. We're talking right after the demise of the Holy Prophet. If alteration is going to happen, it's going to take a while. First of all, the Qur'an wasn't even compiled according to mainstream Islam, once again. I'm not saying that this is an opinion everyone believes in. But it wasn't compiled until Uthman's time. Well then, who, who, where were the verses before that? Well, people knew it. They were written down on different scrolls and deer skin, etc. Right? So, the verses, if they're going to be taken out, there's no book for them to be taken out of. That means these verses are on the tongues and people are saying them. So of course Imam Ali is going to use these verses. Alteration hasn't even taken place yet. Why is it we don't find any account of Imam Ali saying that, yeah, this verse is about me, that verse is about me. It says, Ali yubnu Abi Talib Khalifatullah ala ardi ba'dar rasul or something like that, you know? These are very good points actually. I, I never thought of something like this. This is beautiful. He says, okay, let's put the Ahl al-Bayt aside. How come Abu Dhar? Miqdad, Salman, Ammar bin Yasir, none of these people <laughs> argued with such verses. Once again, put it, let's put things in context here. We're talking <coughs> years, uh, days, months, and years after the Holy Prophet's demise, before the Qur'an was even compiled. Yeah. So then these verses are there. Just like, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ is there. You'll have other verses that are there too. That Ali ibn Abi Talib this, Ali ibn Abi Talib that. Yeah. So he says, look, these are not enough. This is not enough uh, for us to, to just say, hey, uh, yeah, there were verses. These hadiths that tell us that there were certain verses that were taken out, he says, these are not enough. Plus, of course, the fact that they're all weak narrators, they all have problems, etc. that we talked about before. He says, instead of all of this, and basing their arguments on these hadiths, or excuse me, these verses of Qur'an, what did Imam Ali do? What did Fatima Zahra do? He says, uh, they went and started arguing with prophets, hadiths of the Prophet. Started arguing with certain verses of the Qur'an maybe that didn't say Imam Ali's name, but Imam Ali believed that they were re revealed regarding him. 
Why was it that they, do, they, 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 did, they did this instead? This is a very important question, he says. And he makes one last point as well. He says, if the Qur'an is full of these... This is a very important point, by the way. If the Qur'an is full of these verses, that we have hadith that say maybe hundreds of verses might have been taken out, then why is it that, of course, the Shia believe that, uh, ya, that the verse that says, Ya ayyuha rasul ballig ma unzil ilayk min rabbik wa in lam taf'al fama ballagta risalata That famous verse of Ikmal al-Din <coughs> and um, the verse of Tablighi al-Din which says, O Prophet, transmit to the people that which is from your Lord. And if you don't transmit this, you haven't transmitted the whole deen. The whole deen is done. Right? What does the Shia believe? That this verse was revealed? In the last year of the Prophet's life and uh, the, the Hajj that he went, Hajjatul Wida. Okay, question. What did the Prophet, why didn't the Prophet do what he did? Uh, what he was supposed to do? There was fear that he had, they say. Right? The Quran says, uh, don't, fear the pe- don't fear the people, fear Allah. And do what you're supposed to do. This is the question here. The Prophet was afraid. If he says this to the people, they're not ready. And they might cause chaos. The question is here, the million dollar question is, let's say there was tens and according to some hadith, hundreds of verses about this topic before that had been revealed. Why would the Prophet have to be worried now then? This is a very, very important question. This verse that says, O Prophet, transmit to the people what you're supposed to, was revealed in the end. So if there are hundreds or tens of hadith, uh, verses of Qur'an that have been taken out, they must have been revealed before this uh, occasion of Ghadir. Right? So if the Prophet's going to be worried, that's the time he's supposed to be worried. The verses that say, Imam Ali is the Khalifa after you. Not when this verse comes, Balligh ma'unz like min rabbik, that go, O Prophet, make sure that you do tabligh of what you've been told. So he says, this doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up, and I, I totally agree, this is, I mean, yeah, it makes perfect sense to me personally, that if, these, if this is the case, then those hadiths cannot be relied on. Of course, in addition to all the things that I talked about last week as well, about the narrators, where they come from, which books they come from, and how they're, they're, these are all weak, and they're people that, you know, have problems. Like that Asayari individual we talked about last week. Lots of these hadiths come from him. Ayatollah Khoi, same thing. Ayatollah Khoi, one of the biggest of his time, one of the greatest of his time that the Shia owes so much to. Same thing. He, take, he comes guns blazing when it comes to this topic of tahrif al-Quran. So point being, brothers and sisters, yes, there might be some scholars, very few, who might believe in alteration of the Quran. First of all, we have to see what they say. Second of all, if they really mean it or not. Third of all, see if people have gone against them. And fourth of all, let's see their numbers. Is it one versus a thousand or is it 500 versus 500? Right? One versus a hundred is not going to represent mainstream Shiaism, as is the case with the Sunni school, that one person who writes this book that Ayatollah Subhani talked about, Al-Furqan, this one person is not going to represent the Sunni school of thought. And that's why Al-Azhar University uh, professors and ulama and scholars refuted him in that time as well when he gave that book out. Okay, that is Tahrif. I just wanted to give you a little taste of you know what is discussed in all these major books, uh, and that is that this is a subject that you know is very deep. There's a lot of discussion to have and to be ha- to, for for us to have in that regard. But for this for these sessions that we're having, I think that does the job for now. We have a little a couple maybe one more point to discuss and then we'll end, and that is that. Uh, Mus'haf is a term that's used for the Qur'an today, okay? If you go around the world, people might refer to the Qur'an more as Mus'haf than they do Qur'an. So the book that's, that we have, that we call Qur'an, lots of times it is referred to as the Mus'haf. Mus'haf means, you know, something that's bound and has pages, Okay? Ayatul Subhani here on the side, he just explains this just to clarify certain things. 
So that, you know, just in case there are some people out there who this might cause them trouble in understanding what the Shia believe in. He says, look, we talked about alteration of the Qur'an and everything. Now some people might say, O oh Shia, you have the term and you use the term Mus'haf for some things other than the Qur'an as well. That shows that you believe in other Qur'ans as if. Or that there's another version of the Qur'an. Why? In their minds, Mus'haf equals Qur'an. And so if you use Mus'haf for anything else, you're like, okay, then that means you believe in another Qur'an as well. He says, no. Mus'haf, Sahifa, these things, they have a, they have a definition. And that is you know, something that you know, has pages in it. And so this term is sometimes used in the Qur'an as well for something else, not other than the Qur'an. He's, he brings, وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ You know, when the uh, report cards are now passed and spread and distributed amongst the people on the Day of Judgment. We have a verse of the Qur'an. صُحُفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى The books of Ibrahim and Musa السلام, We have another verse. He says, look, the term Mus'haf, Suhuf, Sahifa, these can be used for other than Qur'an as well. As they have been used in the Qur'an itself for other than the Qur'an. So if the Shia have a concept of, you know, uh, Mus'hafu Fatima, the book of Fatima, it doesn't mean that there's another Qur'an that Fatima Zahra has that we believe in that is different than the Qur'an we have today. Or if we have something like Mus'hafu Aliyan or something like that. These are all things that, these are other books that have certain things in them, but they're not Qur'an. So we have to, uh, we have to be um, aware of that as well. I'll just read this last hadith that he has here by Imam al-Sadiq al a hadith regarding what this Mus'hafu Fatima is. <coughs> and to believe, and to be a Shia, you don't even have to believe that there is such a book. All right, but we do have hadith about it, and so mainstream Shiism will have this concept. What is Mus'haf of Fatima? Hadith Abu Jafar relates from Imam al Sadiq that the Mus'haf of Fatima has nothing in it of the Quran. This hadith says, rather, its contents were cast unto her through inspiration after the death of her father, probably through uh, the Malaika or whatever it is. These, there are exalted individuals who, while not being prophets or messengers, nonetheless are spoken to by angels, Ayatollah Subhani says. These individuals are called muhaddatha, which literally means spoken to, or muhaddath. And the blessed daughter of the Holy Prophet was a muhaddath. We also have hadith for that as well, by the way. And so, we believe that after the Holy Prophet, certain information was given to her, and Imam Ali wrote those down transcribe them and there's a book and we don't have access to that book. Brothers and sisters, the Shia school does not have access to that book. That is with the Imam of the time and whenever he returns that that book will also come with him. So Mus'hafu Fatima and things like that as well just because it's called Mus'haf does not mean that the Shia believe in another Quran now that belong to Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Okay, that concludes this part of uh, the chapter which had to do with alteration of the Qur'an, it also con concludes the entire chapter which was Nubuwa Khassa, which is specific prophethood about our Prophet and the Qur'an and his miracle and all that. And also concludes the whole you know, topic of prophethood itself. So we're done with Tawheed, Alhamdulillah. We're done with Nubuwa, Nubuwa Khassa and Amma, both of them, general prophethood, specific prophethood. All of that is done. And moving on to article number 83 will, will be a new chapter. will have to do with Imama and Khilafah. Imam, imamit and Khilafat, Caliphate. Inshallah, that, what a translation that was really. <coughs> imamit and Khilafat. Okay, so these, um, the discussions in that regard we're going to have later, as I said in the beginning of the session. We are going to be taking a break with Mizan Live. We have Dhul Hijjah is upon us. And uh, Dhul Hijjah is full of programs and our centers will, will be having a lot of programs and so me and other instructors um, are going to be very busy so in this month and so we're not going to be able to do Mizan Live in, that one, in this one month. And of course the first 10 days of Muharram also are going to be very, very busy as well. Inshallah, hopefully the plan is that after the first 10 days of Muharram, after Ashura, you will see, a flyer will be put out again 
regarding our sessions and the continuation of our sessions, which is pretty cool that we are going to be starting with Imama and Khilafa. Uh, we're going to be starting that in Muharram, which is the which is the month of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and uh, what Imam Hussein went through as a result of that Imama being usurped from Imam Ali alayhi salam. We believe, we believe, yeah. So till then, inshallah, you know, I want you to keep us in your du'as. Hopefully we can also get more instructors to have their Mizan live sessions whenever that's going to be. But please do dua. Inshallah we will, we will restart our sessions after the first 10 days of Muharram. So in other words, about a month and a half from now is when we're going to um, restart these sessions. Until then, as I said, please keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.